The top stories at this hour. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un sends a letter to the widow of former President Kim Dae-jung as well as Hyundai Group chairwoman Hyun Jong-un. A senior North Korean official says he hopes inter-Korean ties improve next year. Local authorities say a group of hackers who claim responsibility for leaking information from Korea's nuclear power plant operator has been logging in from China. They are asking for Beijing's support in the probe. And the American economy grows at the fastest pace in more than a decade in the third quarter, beating market estimates. Stay tuned for these stories and more coming right up. Very good to have you with us on this Christmas Eve. You are watching Early Edition at 6, coming to you live, live from Seoul. I'm Nahyun Gyal. And I'm Daniel Che. Thank you for joining, joining us. Well, it's Christmas Eve, and I guess uh, North Korea is into the spirit of things, maybe. We begin with two South Korean delegations making a trip to the inter-Korean Kaesong Industrial Complex on this Wednesday. Well, one group was led by Hyundai Group Chairwoman Hyun Jung Un. The other was from the Kim Dae Jung Peace Center, and they came back with letters from North Korean leader Kim Jong Un. One was written to Yi Hee Ho, the widow of late President Kim Dae Jung, and the other to Hyundai Group Chairwoman Hyun Jong Un. In those letters, Kim thanked both for the condolences they sent earlier this month on the third anniversary of his father Kim Jong Il's death. To former First Lady Yi, the North Korean leader also said he hopes she visits the North this coming spring. The letters were delivered by Kim Yang-gun, North Korea's top official in charge of South Korean affairs. And he reportedly said he hopes for improved inter-Korean relations in the new year. That's right. And to give you some context, the two South, Korea groups, uh, South Korean groups have special ties with Pyongyang. Former President Kim Dae-jung held the first ever inter-Korean summit in 2000. And Hyundai Asan ran a joint tour program to the North's Mount Kumgang Resort until it was suspended in 2008. Now, a couple of small theaters in the U.S. say they are willing to screen the movie The Interview. Sony Pictures was more than happy to take them on, up on the offer, but the country's biggest movie chains are still reluctant. For more on this story, here's Jim young -gil. In what some are calling a victory for Hollywood, Sony Pictures says it is now going to release The Interview, a comedy film which depicts the fictional assassination of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un in some U.S. theaters after all. In a statement, the studio's chief executive, Michael Linton, said they had never given up on releasing the movie and that they were excited it will be shown in a number of theaters from Christmas Day. One of the stars of the movie, Seth Rogen, tweeted that the people had spoken and freedom had prevailed. The New York Times reports that the biggest theater chains in the U.S. are still unlikely to screen the film. But Sony will likely be able to patch together distribution in two to three hundred smaller independent theaters. Representatives from the four largest theater chains in the U.S. have declined to comment, only saying that negotiations over the film's release were ongoing. A week ago, Sony scrapped the release of its 44 million U.S. dollar film after their systems were hacked and threats were made against U.S. movie theater chains. The cyber attack was blamed on North Korea and the threats of violence caused major chains to pull the film due to security concerns. The interview has been at the center of escalating tensions between the U.S. and North Korea, with Pyongyang denying it has anything to do with the attack. The White House said President Barack Obama welcomed Sony's decision, as America is a country that believes in free speech. He had earlier criticized Sony's initial decision to cancel the release. Sony Pictures says it will continue to secure more platforms and more theaters so the movie reaches the largest possible audience in the U.S. Tim Young-gil, Arirang News. 
Well, a U.S.-based research group says North Korea's internet connection was partially down again on Wednesday Korea time. This comes after a day after internet access was totally blocked for some 10 hours on Tuesday. A clear answer on who or what may have caused the outage isn't known yet, but what's clear is that the U.S. isn't saying much about its uh, possible involvement. For this, here's Shin Se-min. The U.S. State Department is sidestepping questions on whether the U.S. had a hand in North Korea's internet outage on Monday. Spokesperson Marie Harf told reporters that there was no new information to share about the issue, but added that U.S. President Barack Obama had spoken about the potential responses separate and apart from what we've seen over the past 24 hours, and that it was up to North Korea to address the state of their internet. Tuesday's press briefing came a day after Harf indicated that not all U.S. responses to the hacking would be immediately evident. President Obama repeatedly vowed of a proportional response to what he called the cyber vandalism on Sony. The U.S. is reportedly weighing a new round of financial sanctions on Pyongyang that would target the banks and trading companies used by leader Kim Jong-un and other North Korean officials. The U.S. is also reviewing whether to put North Korea back on its list of state sponsors of terrorism. However, such measures would largely be symbolic. North Korea is already among the most heavily sanctioned countries on Earth, and Harv said there wouldn't be a large practical effect of additional sanctions. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Back here in South Korea, authorities are looking into who is leaking documents from Korea's nuclear power plant operators say it doesn't appear to be a one-man job. They now have a better idea of where the attack may have originated. And for details, here's our Connie Kim. The investigation team is closing in on the hacker who is threatening to release thousands of nuclear reactor data. Authorities say they have tracked the attack to multiple IP addresses in Shenyang, China. And they haven't ruled out North Korea's involvement since the city is close to the border. Authorities believe the attack was planned for two years and that more than one person is responsible. They had discovered earlier in the week that the Twitter ID being used by the hacker was registered in the U.S. South Korea has asked both Beijing and Washington for assistance in their probe. The group of hackers has leaked documents on five separate occasions over the last week. They've threatened to release tens of thousands of additional documents related to the nation's nuclear reactors and destroy control systems if their demands are not met. Those demands? Halt operations at three of Korea's nuclear facilities by Christmas Day or face the consequences. The state-run Korea Hydro and Nuclear Power Company says the leaks pose no threat as the information being released has no impact on safety at the plants. But experts remain skeptical. The hackers say they have about 100,000 pieces of data. Even if that data is not highly classified, it can be reassembled, creating a huge chunk of new information. Then it becomes very dangerous. And in response to the recent security breach, the Energy Ministry conducted a two-day-long cybersecurity drill this week on all of Korea's nuclear facilities. The network security of power plants was reviewed, as was protocol for shutting them down in the case of a malfunction. The Energy Ministry raised its alert level against cyber attacks one notch to the third highest level of caution on Tuesday. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Well, having a sense of awareness is always important, and the number of hacking attacks being reported by individuals here in Korea is on the rise. According to the Korea Internet and Security Agency, nearly 13,000 cases were reported over the first 10 months of this year, up by more than 2,200 from last year. An official from the agency says, though it's not the number of hacking attacks that's on the rise, rather, more people are reporting their cases because they are more aware of the threat now. He added that the number of attacks detected far exceeds those that are reported. Business partners face a one-day entry ban. Digging deeper, getting to the bottom of stories that impact your life, talking with you on air and online, connecting you with experts on the world's most pressing issues, news and current affairs at its best. With Na Hyung Young and Daniel Che. On early edition at six. 
The U.S. economy grew at an annualized 5 percent rate in the third quarter this year. This is the fastest pace in over a decade, and U.S. stocks rallied on Tuesday local time. Experts say the world's largest economy will gain momentum next year. Kim ji tells us more. The world's largest economy grew at an annual rate of 5 percent during the July to September period, the fastest rate of expansion since 2003, and higher than the government's earlier estimate of 3.9 percent. Economists point to strong consumption, especially on health care services. Consumer spending jumped 3.2 percent, its biggest jump this year. Two-thirds of the U.S. economy is related to consumption. And history would suggest that business investment lags consumption or lags economic growth. So if the overall economy is starting to accelerate, then 2015 could also be a fairly strong business investment climate. The data boosted stocks on Wall Street, lifting the Dow Jones above 18,000 for the first time ever. The S&P 500 also closed at a record high. Growth projections in the fourth quarter are expected to record an annual rate of around 2.5 percent and 3 percent next year, putting weight that the U.S. Federal Reserve will stay on course and starts raising interest rates by mid-2015. Boosted by the strengthening labor market and falling oil prices, consumer outlays are expected to help cushion the U.S. economy from uncertainties in China and the Eurozone and a recession in Japan. Kim Jong, Arirang News. Back here in the nation, the Bank of Korea says it will continue its monetary easing policies next year to inject more capital into markets. Taking the country's slow recovery into account, the central bank says it's preparing to revise the government's inflation target level for the time period starting in 2016. The current inflation rate has been in the 1 percent range since November 2012. That's far below the government's target of 2.5 to 3.5 percent. No, but despite the government's ex expansionary fiscal and monetary policies this year, consumer sentiment in the nation isn't getting any better. It dipped to a 15-month low this month. Experts point out that the trend could make more consumers close their purse strings. Kwon Zua explains. Korean consumers are not feeling too good at the moment, with the nation's consumer sentiment dropping for the third straight month in December. The Bank of Korea says its consumer sentiment index stood at 102 this month, a 0.1 point drop from the month before. It now stands at a 15 month low. A reading above 100 does indicate that there are more optimistic consumers than those who expect economic and living conditions to worsen. Experts say that to tackle sluggish domestic demand, more needs to be done to raise consumer confidence so businesses are encouraged to invest. Consumer confidence now is even lower than right after April's deadly Sewolo ferry sinking. The government's monetary policies seem to have improved conditions in August and September, but despite another rate cut in October, things are worsening, raising concerns that planned structural reforms may not have been that effective. When uh, in interest rates fall, typically people, we want people to borrow more, to uh, consume more, uh, buy more housing or invest more, but because we have such a high debt uh, for households, they're not, uh, they're not really borrowing that much to spend. So that path toward higher consumption and higher investment is very weak right now. The central bank says external factors such as falling international oil prices and Russia's currency crisis are also dragging on Koreans' consumer sentiment. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. Korea's service sector has hit its lowest point since the 2008 global financial crisis. Statistics Korea says revenue for the service industry stood at some 1.3 trillion U.S. dollars last year. That's up just 0.8 percent from the previous year. That growth rate is far lower than the average annual growth rate of some 6.5 percent from 2008 to 2013. Experts say a slump in the manufacturing last year trickled into the wholesale and retail sectors. Low consumer spending also played a role in the dip. There are over 2.6 million small service businesses in Korea and over 10 million people working in the industry.
New figures show Korean stocks yield some of the lowest dividends for shareholders compared to other global markets. According to the Spoke Investment Group, Korea's stock market dividend yields over a year period ending in July ranked at the bottom compared to other major markets at a mere 1.1 percent. That's a third of the average of the 22 countries surveyed. Emerging markets like Brazil and China yielded more than the average of 3 percent. The U.S., Japan and India marked less than 2 percent, but were still above Korea. Islamic State militants have a goal of, quote, religious cleansing by murder. That's what the first ever Western journalist who returned from observing the militant group firsthand says. Connie Lee reports. The first ever Western journalist to have direct access to the Islamic State in Syria and Iraq has returned with a strong warning about the militant group. Has the power of a nuclear tsunami. It's incredible. I, I, I was so amazed. I, I, I couldn't understand this enthusiasm. In an interview with ABC News and BBC Radio, the 74-year-old German journalist who traveled with the militants through territories they control says their official philosophy was brutal religious cleansing. We will conquer Europe someday. We will for sure. We'll kill 150 million to 100 million, 500 million. The journalist describes how he saw hundreds of fighters from all over the world arriving in IS territories each day to join the group. He says he's pessimistic that any Western country will be able to stop them. The inside look comes on the heels of a report from Amnesty International, which shows the horrifying reality that women and girls face under the Islamic State. The report says hundreds of women, especially from the Yazidi tribe, are tortured, sexually assaulted, and that girls even younger than 14 years old are held as sex slaves. I am hungry, but it's better than getting sexually assaulted. I can take it all, but I just can't bear the thought of young girls being raped. Across Syria and Iraq, in the midst of rubble and destroyed buildings, are the tens of thousands of Yazidi refugees who have fled the violence of the militants. Connie Lee. I did on news. U.S. Congressman Mike Honda is known for his activities dedicated to resolving Japan's wartime sexual enslavement issue. And he had this to say about what it's like to be talking to Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe about that topic. A waste of time. So what is the alternative? Our Hwang Sung-yi shares with us what Honda said. Representative Mike Honda says it would be a waste of energy and time to put pressure on Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe about Japan's wartime sexual slavery because he has no interest in resolving the issue. In an interview with Seoul-based Yonhap News Agency, Honda said South Korea and the United States should increase pressure at the grassroots level and make them understand that this is a necessity for Japan to do in order to become fully accepted. Honda added the Japanese population over the last two and a half generations has been ignorant about the country's wartime crimes since their government has not been teaching children about it. The congressman recently made a five-day visit to Korea and met with some of the surviving former sex slaves as well as President Park Geun-hye. Honda played a leading role raising U.S. awareness about the issue, including making House Resolution 121, which urges Japan to formally acknowledge, apologize and accept historical responsibility into a law. Saying that time is running out for the elderly victims, Honda said he is open to taking fresh action in Congress. But Honda said it is time for the White House and the State Department to turn up the heat and turn the screws on Japan for a sincere apology. However, with his landslide victory in recent snap elections, experts expect Abe to walk a clear path of an ultra-right-wing leader who wants to see Japan restored to what he believes was its wartime greatness. Hwang Sang-hee, Arirang News. Well, on a lighter note, if you are in Korea, especially in the capital Seoul, you couldn't. 
have missed the Christmas decorations on the streets. Right. In some countries, they, the government actually put out rewards for the best decorated buildings. But oh, wow. in Korea, we don't need that. People are willing to do it in the spirit of the holiday. Well, our immunity takes us to the Christmas spirit and to the next level. And she hits the streets to show us what it's like on Christmas in Korea. While millions of lives around the world prepare for old St. Nick, so have the people of Korea. Families and friends gather for the holiday cheer. But Christmas wasn't always this way. After the establishment of Catholicism in the 19th century, Christmas was first introduced to Korea. And it only continued to spread, celebrated by both children and adults recognized as a very special time of the year. In the 60s and 70s, Korea was under a strict curfew imposed by the military government. However, the curfew would be lifted on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. So the holiday became very special and well known. It wasn't until around the 90s when Christmas really became about the kids, families and couples. So, what does Christmas of the 21st century look like? Well, it's become more festive and more merry than ever before. To alleviate some of the stress and hardship of 2014, Sadamun has created something very special. A street dedicated entirely to a Christmas street festival. They've blocked the roads and decked the halls to spread the Christmas cheer. And it's not every day you can hug Santa, or many Santas for that matter each eagerly waiting to warm the spirits of all with their free hugs. The holidays are a time for people from all different walks of life to gather, some looking for the Christmas spirit, while some are looking to give it out. From coloring ceramic figurines with your family, to making hand-punched and printed Christmas cards with friends, a row of festive do-it-yourself booths await to entertain those passing by. And of course, Christmas wouldn't be the same without a tray of Santa's favorite cookies. Each dollop of frosting and ornate decoration precisely placed by hand. Because Rudolph once told me that Santa likes his cookies homemade. Once the sun goes down, the party isn't over. Bright lights and twinkling stars ignite the skies. Christmas is definitely in the air. But as this is a festival of a rather special nature, you can't forget the music. And it doesn't always need to be all prim and proper. These musicians are here with a rock and roll of a good time for an audience ready to dance the night away. Even though December means freezing temperatures outside, the cold doesn't stop these people, warm with the Christmas spirit. Under a festive night sky, it's time to jingle all the way, because this year, there's a merry, merry Christmas waiting for you. Im Yoon-hee, Arirang News. Today, Sarah, Imuni is going to bring Christmas to a new level. 
<laughs> I think yes. I did. Well, she was my secret Santa, so in some sense, she did. Yeah, she did, at least to one person, right? <laughs> well, I heard we are not going to have a white Christmas. Yeah, why do you year, keep right? saying that? I told you that I wanted to have Christmas with white snow. But anyway. Hope springs eternal. <laughs> Let's turn to our Kim bo -kyung, who's standing by at the Weather Center to give us the latest on the weather front. bo -kyung. Well, Merry Christmas Eve, guys. Today, we woke up to wet conditions here in the capital, but things quickly cleared up by the afternoon. However, some places including the Chungcheong provinces, may continue to get light showers through later tonight. It's not the guest we'd want for Christmas, but fine dust is back and currently levels are over 120 micrograms per cubic meter in Chungcheong province, so those with respiratory problems should take a caution. So far, today has been a mild winter day, warmer than the seasonal average, but cold air is gradually moving in. In fact, cold wave advisories have been issued for the northern part of the country. The morning low on Christmas Day should dip to minus 6 before rising to 3 in the afternoon, relatively comfortable for outdoor activities. Other than that, moderate winter weather is in store for the rest of the week. On to tomorrow's ratings. Seoul makes it to 3, Daegu hits 6, Busan makes it to 8. On to other regions, Daejeon and Dokdo make it to 4, Jeju hits 7, Mang Kumgang drops to minus 8. Well, I wish you a lovely Christmas Eve and I'll be back with more after 8. Well, thank you for that, Bogyoung. Well, uh, Christmas is just around the corner, so I hope wherever you are, if you are celebrating the holidays, uh, prepare well and uh, have no regrets later on once the holidays are over. Mm -hmm. This has been Daniel Che. And I'm Nahyun Gyeong, wishing everyone a happy Christmas wherever you are. Uh, we'll be back on Friday. Bye-bye for now.